Let's spend a few minutes here today talking about how elephants simply do not float on clouds. And we see this illustrated. Let's go ahead and draw this out as to the critical elements of success for our environment. So let's go ahead and draw here on the board a um, elephant representing, of course, big data and what some of those critical elements are that we're going to try to focus our attention on today. Those analytical success criteria include performance, security, and of course, cost. So let's go ahead and jump right into the material and let's review some of these basics of big data. And then we're going to move into what the data lake is and what these collectors are. So this is from a very high level, the basics of what data analytics does. This is what we want to enable within our environments, whether we're a federal agency or a corporation, we want to be able to get use out of all of the data that we have in our environments. And so here we see represented on the screen, uh, starting at the kind of the middle there, log files. So these represent files that are coming from, you know, event logs app generated by applications or what have you, right, or operating systems. We have social media and applications. So we have both unstructured and structured data, and we're going to go into more detail here in just a minute. But with all of this information, it's critical that we can, represent it on the right side, visualize that data. So it does us no good to collect large amounts of data and then not be able to actually turn them into a result that we need to better our business, A, or B, have the data structure so paralyzed by the amount of data that we can no longer function within it. So we're going to talk about how we avoid falling into those issues, right, and avoid those challenges that too often uh, plague environments that are destined to do data analytics. So let's look at some of these data collectors and what the data lake is. So this term data lake is somewhat new in the industry and it represents just, and we're drawing out here on the screen, a lake, which we're gonna call the data lake for this example. And let's go ahead and put up on the screen several of the components that feed into the data lake. And we're gonna talk about each one of these individually here for just a few minutes. So of course, in the upper left-hand corner, kind of starting from there and moving around the circle, we have GOTS and COTS applications. So those are government off the shelf and commercial off the shelf applications that go into the data lake. Now, obviously the applications themselves aren't going inside of the data lake, but the data that they produce or use on a everyday basis to provide a service it can be components of the data lake. So for example, if I had a specialized application that I'm running, maybe it's maybe I'm in the medical field and I'm running a, um, a scheduling program. Well, that scheduling program may be a government off the shelf. Maybe it's, it's created by a bunch of the brilliant people there in the Department of Veterans Affairs and they've created a scheduling package. Well, they wanna be able to collect that data that's occurring within that package. Great, no problem. Stick it in the data lake and that data now becomes available to be merged and analyzed and, and extract value from um, it, when it's in combination with all these other data sources. So let's continue on down. Audio, so audio files are things that we've recorded, right? We wanna be able to look through those audio files and extract pieces of information that are important to us. So audio files, whether we're collecting them, whether they've been collected, whether it's surveillance information, whatever, what have you, audio, of course, is very important in an unstructured format, right? We've talked about, we've got and cots kind of structured data. We've talked about audio, which is unstructured. And then, of course, kind of the mother load of unstructured data would be things that we find within the social media realm, uh, Facebook, Twitter, things of that nature. Let's, let's give a, a real quick example of how unstructured data inside a data analytics environment can be very, very advantageous for us. Let's just use Twitter and Facebook as an example. So Joe um, Snuffy comes home from school one day and he realizes that he's got the sniffles. 
And so his mom says, oh, Joe's got a, a, a little sniffle problem here. He must be coming down with a cold. So, of course, because she's Facebooking and maybe even using Twitter, she's tweeting this out and Facebooking to her friends. My son Joe came home from school today and he's got the sniffles. Have anybody, has anybody else out there seen this with their child? So, of course, all of the mothers who are united here in cause, um, they will go and uh, everybody, you know, make sure their, their uh, little ones are, are safe and, and don't have the sniffles. Well, that's all fine and dandy. And so we're kind of community aware and everybody knows that, you know, they need to dress a little warmer or wash your hands more often or something of that nature because Joe Snuffing now has the sniffles. That's great from a social perspective and keeping everyone healthy. But now look at it from a business perspective. Now let's say that um, they're, they're using Twitter or Facebook or Snapchat or whatever means that they are to, to talk about Joe Snuffy's issue with having a cold. Now think from a business perspective, if I'm Walgreens or Walmart or uh, any one of these places that you can go and buy uh, pharmaceutical type of uh, products, grocery markets, all of these. Certainly, no endorsements of these of these companies that do that. But you know, I mean, I use them, right? I think we all do. So, how can how can a Walmart, for example, take advantage of Joe Snuffy and his cold? Well, Walmart can track using data analytics, pulling unstructured data from a 30 mile radius of their store. And they can see how many people are actually talking about getting colds and how many people are complaining about being sick. And they can actually stock up on new product to provide that to all these folks that need that level of support, right? That medication, or of course, they can increase their prices or they can watch what their competitors are doing and provide coupons. All of these things, derivatives of a, of a clear analytical environment where they're using logic, taking unstructured data and putting it together. So let's continue on from that example back to our picture here about the data lake. So security operations and data. So imagine now a world where we can predictively and proactively understand the security profile of our environment. So we're collecting from log aggregators, for example, like ArcSight, a great, great log aggregator offered by HP, or Quest, or any of these other tools, maybe even Splunk, whatever it is that you're using to create and unify information, Nagios, um, you can use that as part of your data lake. Video data, of course, you know, um, I was told once by a, a buddy of mine that does data analytics that there's 273 cameras from the time you get off the airplane at Dulles um, International Airport, right? It's one of the Washington DC Basin airports. By the time you get from that airport to the outer loop, which is the, I believe it's the 495 loop, if I remember right, a loop that goes around Washington DC, there's 273 cameras taking video. And we know through recent news events that police have cameras on, geez, I think they're wearing them on their uniforms now. Um, certainly on their cars. Uh, we know our military uh, uses lots of video. Um, so this video, being able to capture it and actually make sense of it, part of the data lake. Structured data, of course, we talked about. You know, a great example of structured data would be an exchange database, for example, uh, an email database or maybe a an Oracle database or something of that nature, um, very structured row and column type of data structure. And then of course you have your archive data, right? This is the data for some agencies that has to be there for 75 years. Uh, this is data that we collect over the course of time. So all of this good when we talk about what data lakes and collectors are. So I think we can all agree that there's a lot of data and that we have to be able to manage this data efficiently. And so to do that, we really need to focus on technologies that will provide us with the performance that we need in order 
to get through this issue. And we'll talk about, I have another story for you here in just a minute after we talk a little bit about performance of our environment. So let's talk about performance, how it deals with data, right? And big data initiatives. And let's start at the core of the problem, which is the database itself. This database has to perform well. We cannot be inhibited in our database. So here we're drawing out on the screen a database with hard drive. And let's talk about the basics of what database performance is. And we're going to talk a little more technical detail, but I think everybody can appreciate this. Represented there in the red is a packet that's going down. And so the glasses indicate that this is a read operation. The second type of operation that occurs within a database represented here in the purple square are write operations. So here we write to a database. All of that writes down to the hard drive itself. Now, whether we're using, maybe we're all in flash or whatever it is, it's getting written somewhere. That information gets written somewhere so that we can retrieve it through reads located at the lower right hand corner, or that we can edit or add to it, or maybe even delete it, modify that record with writes represented in the upper right with the pencil there. So what is the big deal here with reads and writes to a data structure? Well, reads and writes, we know that we write, um, typically data is written once um, and read multiple times. And unfortunately, a lot of data is written once and read only once. Uh, but anyways, whatever that is, it creates disk IO. So the speed of the disk, right? How fast are the input and output operations occurring on that disk? So this is a key takeaway here. If you've got nothing so far from what we've been rambling here for the last 10 minutes, how, do, how fast can we read and write the data onto disk? Now, I'm not talking about performance of actual hard drives, although that is a critical element here we have to take into consideration, whether we use a storage area network, whether we use direct attach, whether whatever it is that we use, that is a criteria. The type of RAID we use is another criteria. The, the physical um, specifications of the device that we're writing to, right? Whether that hard drive is a fiber drive, a, a flash drive, a, you know, whatever, right? A SATA drive. All of those things have different read-write performances or what we typically refer to is IOs per second or IOPS. We're talking about that and that's, those are critical. But let's look at something else that is often overlooked and we can talk about that, uh, about disk types and things of that nature at any time if you like. But let's talk about something else that you may not have considered related to disk performance or database performance, right? Because remember, big data is a database. There's lots of data in there. It's a data structure, not necessarily a database, although it has similar traits to a database. And in fact, it stores a lot of its data in a database, data structure. So nevertheless, let's go ahead and look at something called run length encoding or RLE. And this allows us to optimize our data. And this is a little tricky. So let's look at the location here. 00112, right? This, when you look at the location of all these, it's just a few files. See the zeros, ones, and now in the next column just popped up four comma zero, meaning there's four zeros, three comma one, there's, there's, right? So let's go over this. Nick, Michelle, Austin, and Lindsay all live in area zero, right? Cooper, McKay, and Hunter all live in area one or represented by three comma one. And Jackson lives in area two, represented by one person comma in area two. Now, when we look at that, the original column was eight bits. The second column is six bits. Now you say to yourself, okay, so I saved two bits. Um, so it's no big deal. Years ago with two bits, I could buy a cup of coffee. Um, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of records. So multiple repeating values for each row as represented here in the uh, locations, right, 0, 0, 0, 0, 4 of them, 1, 1, 1, 3 of them, and 1, 2. So where does RLE really come into action? 
It comes into action when we have lots of repeating values in each row. So a location, for example, location zero could be Utah, location one could be Virginia, location two could be California. All of those are the same, right? Utah, California, Virginia, and there may be lots of people in your data structure that have those location traits, all right? So when we have multiple repeating values for each row, that's one of the critical things and where RLE comes, comes in, in handy. Analytical data with large data sets. So now imagine in a structured database, we're inputting data, the application is generating inputs and, and deletions, right? It's modifying data, but we are consuming, as we saw with the data lake, lots and lots and lots of data, just an unimaginable amount of data. Imagine those 273 cameras we mentioned earlier that are taking video 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So how much video feed are we getting from those 273 cameras? A lot of video feed. I don't know what the number is, but it's a lot, a lot. Uh, almost too much like counting the um, grains of sand on a shore. I mean, it's that much. So analytical data is large and there are a lot of repeating values found within analytical data. So it makes logical sense that we need to implement a technology like RLE to help us. All right, so long rows um, will take multiple IO seeks Right, so the way a data structure works with really long rows, so you can imagine now, you know, the grains of sand on a beach, we've got lots and lots and lots of those things that we're looking through, those data packets. Now, those rows take lots of time to seek. And so as we continue to add more data and pile it on uh, in our data lake, um, this problem only gets worse, right? We're gonna have more and more of a challenge. Rows. Um, that are very small, that are transactional based, um, these are not good candidates for RLE. These uh, transactional databases, they don't work with um, run length encoding. It's not the right thing, right? If you need fast burst, we use a different type of column and row data structure um, where you know it's, it's optimized to handle those type of things. RLE also reduces the disk IO, right? Because now, as represented to the left there, we have the four zeros instead of representing them as four zeros. Now think of that not as four zeros, but four million zeros. So we have a location, there's four million locations in location zero. And, in, and if we were doing it as a standard data structure, we would have four million rows with zero, 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 zero all in those columns. Now, if we were to take and do it in, a, in an RLE, what it's gonna do is it's going to take the four and it'll say one million comma zero. So the bits will be considerably smaller. All right, so let's move on to, so RLE, very important. I know we just kind of scratched the surface on what this technology does, but you wanna make sure that whatever data analytics engine you have, whether you understand this or not, I think, looking at your faces, I think you guys all kind of get it, that if I'm trying to look for one grain of sand on a beach, I wanna make sure that I'm looking for it as fast as possible in the most optimal way, and RLE will provide that for you. So just make sure when you look at data analytics solutions that RLE is a primary component and that they use that level of technology. All right, let's keep moving here to security. So we're going to breeze over security. Um, well, not breeze over it, but we're going to talk a little bit about security as it relates to data at rest and data in flight. So here we're drawing a picture of California. Um, and it is, uh, of course, um, a state with a data center in it. You see there Ohio in the upper right hand corner. We're drawing out on the screen the server storage and the data represented in the red boxes there. All of these facilities and the cloud, can't forget that up in the left. This is data at rest. The, the data is sitting there, it's resting. Now let's draw out another packet that says, okay, I'm gonna move that data in between these data centers. That's called data in flight, data in flight. 
So pretty simple concept. Data at rest is resting at the data centers. Data in between the data centers are in flight. And the key here, the key takeaway is we need to make sure that we're using FIPS 140-2 within our data structure to ensure that the data at rest at the sites, all this data represented in those gray circles you see on the screen, as well as the data in flight, all of it, all of it is secured and encrypted to the FIPS 140-2 uh, encryption algorithm. So that is an absolute. So when looking again for a data analytics solution, make sure that it is 140-2, FIPS 140-2 compliant if you're in a federal agency. Now let's say you're not in a federal agency. Hey, you still want to make sure that data is encrypted and FIPS 140-2 is a great standard to do that by. So let's talk a little bit about this database encryption. Database encryption here, we're representing here with the data structure that you see and the data there represented in green, and it's locked and secured. And in most databases, they have applications that do this and it does it wonderfully. The challenge here when you come to data analytics is that data now represented in the red there moves around a lot. This data is not just isolated. All of the functions related to that data do not just occur in that database. The functions actually occur on a server perhaps or on a desktop as represented here. Often, often this data is moved to another location in data analytics. So let's say that you have an Oracle database and nothing against Oracle. They've done a wonderful job with their database and they secure it exceptionally well. And so when you run operations within that data, whether you're doing data mining or, or what have you, you're, you're within their secure envelope. They're keeping you, keeping you, um, if you've ever seen uh, the movie uh, Drill Bit Taylor, they're keeping you under his wing, right? Oracle's got you under his wing. Anyway, yeah, I see a couple of you smiling out there. Pretty funny movie. Nevertheless, they're keeping you under their wing of security, right? They're holding on to you. So that's good. It's great. But when you work in a data analytic environment, that Oracle database, nothing against Oracle here, but that Oracle could be any database. I'm just using Oracle as an example because many of you relate to it. That could be any data structure. Doesn't matter. Typically, the data structure secures everything to run operations within itself. It does not secure things when they go outside of its environment. And in a data analytics environment, data is at risk. So a lot of stakeholders say, well, I'm okay because my data structure's very secure. Absolutely it is. But in a data analytics model, that data is floating all over the place in that lake. It's swimming everywhere. And so you want to make sure that it's encrypted. And there are ways to do that. And we're, we're going to talk about one of them today called secure stateless tokenization. So let's go ahead and draw out what this means. We have a virtual appliance in the environment. And this virtual appliance, and we have a social security number from a from a um, from a soldier. We're just going to kind of draw this out here real quick. These tables of the virtual appliance generate static tables according to 140-2, by the way, which generates a unique random token. No data is associated directly with that token, right? And it is everything is performed in memory, stateless tokenization. So let's look at this in a little more detail. We kind of ran through that. Uh, pretty quick here, but let's go ahead and look at this in detail. So a soldier has a social security number that's generated and used through some sort of application and may be transferred via clear text. There's lots of scenarios here. I'm just describing one of many, one of many. And it goes to this virtual appliance that provides secure stateless tokenization. It has a table basically, creates a random token automatically on the fly in memory and and produces in green there a token this is a secure stateless token it's compliant with 140-2 that token then and that data is transferred with it and um, moved around the system the token is moved around the system so the original data is never associated directly with the token so that it's very very secure this technology is used predominantly in, um, and, and kind of the, the first adopters in a big way, um, is in the credit card industry. 
So when you, when you use credit cards, um, this is that technology that allows you to, you know, use your credit cards securely within an environment, pass them around because um, it's secure stateless tokenization. We don't spend a lot of time talking about this. I have a whole nother lecture series just on secure stateless tokenization. But when you're looking for, so here's the key takeaway. When you're looking for a data analytics environment, remember we want RLE for performance. We want secure stateless tokenization to, to encapsulate and secure that data analytical environment. So that when data moves, we gave the example about the database previously, when data moves within the environment, we can ensure that that entire data structure is secure. And so on that, let's talk about end-to-end -end data analytical security. So what do we need to watch out for? And we've kind of talked about this. We're gonna draw out the data lake again. And the data lake, of course, has lots and lots of data of unstructured data, structured data, right? The video, the audio, all of that stuff. Everything is in there. We also have the structured stuff, right? Databases, tables, things of that nature. So we need to make sure that as that data moves around to the servers that may be processing that data and going out to different federal agencies or consumed by your federal agency, that it's compliant with FIPS 140-2 and that everything end-to-end -end is secure. So let's talk about some of those. One of the great advantages of an end-to-end -end security profile is it separates duties, right? And when you're doing ATOs, there's a huge push for separation of duties and an authority to operate. Now, if you're listening and you're not a federal agency and an ATO is something you've never really heard of, I can guarantee you within your own security plans, whatever you call them, that there is a separation of duties. You don't want the fox um, watching the hen house, right? And so you have to be able to separate these duties out. Um, an end-to-end -end analytical security model, which is, which is what we're talking about here, when you implement data analytics, you wanna go with some form of end-to-end -end security model. It um, uh, supports multiple environments, right? It, will, uh, it gets down at the application layer as you need. Um, with, with an end-to-end -end security model, we can leverage existing tools, but in addition, reduce kind of the complexity and costs associated with your security model, right? Simplify that as well as reduce um, some of your compliance management headaches because when you pass off information in a secure environment between different security nodes or operators, right? Software or hardware, you have to document all of that in an authority to operate. And so we're gonna simplify that through a secure stateless tokenization and kind of this end-to-end -end approach uh, to security. So let's talk a little bit here and kind of end this on talking about how we optimize our cost. And on many of my videos, you'll, I will talk about this concept of horizontal scalability as it applies to your ATOs. And this is a critical component. The key takeaway here is represented on the left, whether I have 500 disks, or whether represented on the far right, I have 5,000 disks. I, this is a storage environment. I wanna make sure in this example that I have the same operating system across all of my storage devices so that it is a minimal impact on my ATO. So what, what do I really mean by that? When you harden, quote unquote harden, right? Secure a storage device to be used within your environment, whether you're an ATO or not, it doesn't matter, right? Doesn't matter the security profile. You still want to have a hardened piece of security around, you know, process and policy, what we call hardening, to make sure that you don't have vulnerabilities, that the operating system of that storage device isn't broadcasting out, and that the bad guys can't come in and take our data. It's a centralized storage location for data, so we don't want bad guys in there. So whatever it is that you're doing, you're going to spend time and money invested in hardening that operating system. What I'm suggesting here with horizontal scalability is that if you have, and, and by the way, just another clarifier here, a storage device, when you buy storage devices, the controller, the thing that controls the operation of those disks is limited. It's got its limits. It's not endless. 
You can't just say I'm going to buy a storage controller and it's going to control a million disks. There are certain other things that have to happen like compute and cache and all, all type RAID operations is needed. All of those things are considerations for the storage controller. So we have a controller, it's got its limits. And with all vendors that I've ever been exposed to, which have been many, um, and that's how they sell it, right? They sell, okay, this device will support up to 500 devices, or as represented in the far right, it'll support up to 5,000 devices. So whatever that is, we, we buy accordingly. What uh, the message and the key takeaway to this slide is if I buy a device that supports 500 disks today because my environment is small and I want to just get started and provide service, and then in two years from now, if Gardner is right and our data is doubling every 18 months, I need to buy a device that supports 5,000 represented on the far right. I want to make sure that the hardening effort, which by the way can be expensive, 20, 40, $100,000 to harden something, depending upon the level of hardening and the complexity and the problems you have with the device. I want to make sure that when I go to that 5,000 discs over on my far right here, the big storage, that whatever effort I put in on the small one is going to apply to the big one. That's called horizontal scalability. So make sure the same operating system works on all storage nodes. Another point of savings for you in a data analytics environment is SDN. And SDN here, we're just going to draw out here some of the key areas of cost, right? We have, of course, the labor to provision, manage that environment. We have the applications and ports that need to be set up. We have our firewall rules and security, data plane, forwarding plane, routing planes, all of that, as well as your firewalls. And then to add complexity to these network touch points that we're doing with, within our network environments today, our target is changing, right? Our customers are saying, I want it on that server. I want it in-house. I want it to a geographically dispersed data center, or I want it on the cloud. Whatever it is, you're saying there's a lot to do. So what does SDN do for you? A software defined network then takes a lot of this complexity and puts it underneath the software defined environment, provisioning management and consistency of the way you provision those switches under SDN. Applications, they become dynamic and require different ports to be adjusted, or you need different or more switches, for example, to be provisioned to satisfy this need and then deprovision them all within SDN. When you talk about how your routers, your data plane, your forwarding planes, your routing tables, all of those adjustments that are needed to make everything successful, that can all be done under SDN, all with software policy and automated workflow. And then of course, regardless of where your target is, we can adjust that target, adjust fire very easily and securely and consistently all within SDN. So all of these things, these are just some of the benefits you get with software defined networking. Now I know some of you say, well, I'm already doing some of that stuff. Absolutely. There are appliances in the market today that do all of that. What I would submit to you is that SDN is a software driven solution that will provide a level of repeatable functionality in your environment that will enhance your security profile a great deal. Not only will it do that, but it will reduce your cost in an amazing way, right? If you can now commoditize that network stack, for example, and, and, and get away from vendor specific network infrastructure. We've seen this trend all over the industry, right? In IT, desktops, laptops, right? All the way up through the stack. We see a lot of this commoditization, right? Strip away the price. It's all kind of the same. Now I know that lots of vendors, HP included, have some very unique attributes to a lot of our platforms that separate us from everyone else. So it's, we're not really a commodity per se, uh, but in general, I mean, that's kind of the way it is, right, in the industry. So how do we get started? So that's SDN, being able to save money. How do we get started establishing this core foundation, this, this secure foundation that we have? Well, th this is um, kind of, I'm going to go through some of those steps and how to do that. The first step 
that you need to do is build a performance compute core. You need to build the right servers. Now, there will be niche players out there that say, well, I can do this really well and I can do that really well. At the end of the day, you're going to want, if at all possible, go with a player that has lots of variety, right? Lots of compute, lots of different ways to do compute, and they're investing in the future. Second thing is to build a storage, a flexible storage core that allows me to have all types of storage in my environment. Block, for example, drawn out here, direct attach storage as well. Now, direct attach is very associated with big data. Big data analytics loves close to disk, close to compute uh, storage. Of course, file and object storage, which is kind of perhaps a little newer for many environments, uh, but will considerably drive down your costs and create a different model for you. And then, of course, we need to be able to deliver it. We need to deliver it securely through all types of delivery mechanisms. So some of the strengths here that we're really looking at is, and kind of in review, uh, we've talked about horizontal scalability, ATOs, uh, that strength, right? We talked about that integrated system management. So you wanna find some sort of data analytics engine and company, remember elephants do not float on clouds. They take all of this, all of these three areas to actually produce a data analytics environment. So you want some sort of integrated system management in the storage arena. You need that flexibility, right? Cost, block, object, file, and so on, as well as some sort of automated workflow to reduce your cost, then provisioning those type of technologies. Now, STIG and NIST enablement. This means in the federal government, this means that there has been um, that the devices that you're purchasing have already been ATO'd. So what that means to you is two things. One is you can rest assured that it made it, it was successful once, it passed once, more than likely it will pass on with you as well, right? Because each ATO is specific to the environment and to the agency and, and to the organization. So, but you can rest assured that if it did it once, it will more than likely do it again. That means that all of the severity threes are gone. Right? There may be some severity one uh, risk in there that you may have to take on, but generally speaking, it's secure, you're good to go. That's STIG and NIST enablement. Please don't misunderstand. Just because it's gone through the STIG process doesn't necessarily mean that your security officer is gonna accept it, right? There's no guarantees, but it gets you a long way down that road. It's, you're not starting from scratch. And then of course, we have to always focus on, when we talk about data analytics, performance, security, and availability, which we've talked about. So can you lean on HP for any of these technologies? You can. HP actually has several of these technologies. In delivery, we have ArcSight, probably the best security uh, implementation log aggregation. We have Helion, of course, we have Voltage, uh, Tipping Point, and Fortify. Eucalyptus is a hybrid cloud. You got Docker and OpenStack as great partners, Docker for containers. And of course, we talked about SDN with OpenFlow and Helion as a um, open OpenStack, excuse me, um, open source um, type of uh, OpenStack uh, framework. <laughs> I don't know why I'm fumbling on my words there. Sorry about that. Maybe it was just coming on the screen too fast. Um, and so that's kind of in your delivery, right? We can deliver it via cloud, uh, consolidated uh, infrastructure uh, called converged, hyper-converged. All these things are available. And we've got lots of product and partnerships that help with that. When we talk about building a, a flexible core. We talked about the, the great importance of STIG related, right? Something that's already gone through the process and been successful. That's going to save you a lot of time and money. And then HP's three-par storage is probably the best in the industry. I believe it is. I mean, not that HP has just made it even better than it was uh, before the acquisition. And before the acquisition, it was a wonderful piece of, uh, of storage. So three-par, absolutely critical. Um, does a lot of the things we talked about in building a flexible storage environment. And Clever Safe, for those of you that are looking at object storage, great partnership and lots of enablement on HP hardware. And of course, when we talk about data analytics, truly talk about data analytics, some of the leaders in the industry would be Vertica and Autonomy, giving you the strength integration, 
points between um, structured and unstructured data as well as integration with other products that you see on this screen and hardware. So one of the advantages is elephants do not float on clouds. They don't float out there all by themselves. They need structure, they need infrastructure, and they need compatibility and integration throughout the entire stack. And that's what, uh, that's what HP offers with Vertica Autonomy and Many Haven, um, which is a collection of product. Lots of great programs going on at HP to help you with that. And then of course, our partnerships with Hadoop and Hortonworks are stellar and have been around for a while. So what are three things to remember? The first thing I'd like you to remember as we, as we end today, get something that's STIG and NIST certified. It, excuse me, I don't want to use the word certified because it's not certified. Get something that has gone through the STIG and NIST authorization process, right? Get, get a foot up so you don't have to spend that money. So that's one thing that you need to do. HP has several. Uh, they run uh, lots of equipment at DISA. Our security uh, stance with ArcSight is absolutely wonderful. Remember, I'm just highlighting one product um, of each of these. We've got lots of solutions. When it comes to performance and data analytics, take a close look at Vertica. Vertica is an awesome product, has always been a great product, and really state-of-the-art when it comes to performance and the ability to really ingest large, large amounts of data. And then of course, when it comes to savings and efficiency, look at technologies like SDN and 3PAR that offers you these type of uh, thin provisioning and storage flexibility within your environment that is unparalleled in the industry. So my name, again, Jeffrey Lush, my contact information is right here on the screen. If you have any additional questions, I am happy to answer them.